My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And we're going to start the year by looking into the future. I have a guest today who is, he has written a book that gets into what the next 10 years are going to look like. And I think it's important to think about this because as you plan your life as a FOMO sapiens, knowing what is coming down the pike is going to be so important to making smart decisions. And my guest, Alec Ross, is the guy to talk about this. Now, he's a very interesting guy. I actually first encountered him about, I guess, a decade ago or so. I saw him speak at this big conference at Radio City Music Hall, and he was so impressive. And I was like, I had FOMO. I was sort of like, this guy is doing all the stuff I want to do. And I never heard of him before, but he is awesome. And so I have followed his career. And when his new book came out, I was so excited to hear that he would like to come on FOMO Sapiens. Now, he is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Industries of the Future. And during the Obama administration, he served as a senior advisor for innovation to the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. He is also now a distinguished visiting professor at the University of Bologna Business School. So he gets to hang out in Italy and apparently Bologna has the best food in Italy. So that sounds good to me too. He is all over the place. He has been on Fareed Zakaria on CNN, which is another show. I mean, I would kill to be on that show. So again, Alec giving me the FOMO. And he has also been on a lot of other places like A16Z, The Good Life Project, Squawk Box, Bloomberg TV, and many other programs. Now today, you're going to learn how to start thinking about what is coming ahead. You're also going to learn how somebody like Alec can do a ton of different things. I think his sort of career path is a really interesting, it's an interesting model for the rest of us to think about how we can do a lot of different things. And he, as I mentioned, he has been a professor. Of course, he has worked at the State Department, but he's also been a teacher. He started out as a teacher, sixth grade teacher, and then he ran for governor and he didn't get that, by the way. And he talks about that in our interview. And of course, he's an author. Now, I have a small ask for you. It's an easy one, but important. I have a new website at patrickmcginnis.com and I would love you to take a look and let me know what you think. And if you see any typos, please tell me because we don't like typos. I'm very, very, I guess a stickler about that. So I, I put out this new site. I'm excited about it. It's fresh and new and it's got some cool new things on it. But without having your feedback, I don't know if you like it and I would like to know that. <laughs> All right, that is a small ask. And now on to the interview. As you know, I'd like to start every interview with the same question. And so I asked Alec this exact question. What's the most important decision that you've had to make to get to where you are today? I love that question. It was back, I was on Obama's presidential transition team and I was being offered fancy important jobs that had existed for decades and in some cases a century or more. And instead of taking one of these traditional jobs with a big staff and a big budget. I created my own job uh, at the State Department, basically creating an innovation agenda inside our foreign policy. So basically creating a startup inside Obama world. And so like, what did that mean? Because everybody, so I saw Alex speak many years ago. He was on the stage at Radio City Music Hall. And I remember you saying you'd been, to, I don't know, some crazy number of countries. So I just like, tell us a little bit about what you did, because I thought it was really cool. What, what did you do? And then what kind of, what do you think you achieved? Well, I, I appreciate that question. What did I do? I, there were new instruments of power. I mean, this is super obvious now, but 10, 15 years ago, it was less obvious that technology redistributed power in a significant way. And if you think about like the government, you've got the CIA, you've got the NSA, you've got the Defense Department, you've got the State Department. All of those have like their lines of responsibility, but there wasn't really a space of people using technology to solve foreign policy problems unless it was like a drone strike or <laughs> intercepting communications. So I built this crazy team that built projects varying from, can we create a system 
leveraging video technology to reduce sexual violence in refugee camps in the East Congo to can we stop the surgical political assassinations taking place in Syria because the Assad regime can geolocate people on their cell phones to can we create a relief program in Haiti so that it, Americans by texting the word Haiti to a short code can make a $10 donation. So it was really about bringing a group of young people largely with a strong technology affinity and partnering them up with the sort of foreign policy establishment to try to make good things happen around the world. And I think we were, we were very successful. You know, a lot of people come out of government with a, a little bit of a chip on their shoulder and they lament all the things that didn't go well. But I came out of the experience feeling like, you know, goodness, I hope to be a grandfather one day with my grandchildren on my knee and telling the stories of the great things that we did. And to your question of how many countries I went to, I think in my my four years working for Obama in his administration, I, tra I traveled 950 some thousand miles to 41 <laughs> countries, two round trips to the moon with a side trip to New Zealand. That sounds like I've had those years too, so I get it. And what I like about the role, and I think it's cool, is you know, when we think about technology, a lot of times you mentioned drones, for example. It's like, okay, let's use technology to do things that maybe aren't, maybe they're important, maybe they're important for defense, maybe they're important for espionage and counterterrorism, but they're not lifting up people's lives. And what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years is the internet and connectivity has gone global. And you know, a lot of work I do, you know, goes, I go to Africa or, or parts of Asia and you see people are starting companies in you know every part of the earth, every corner of the earth, and they're able to build businesses and they're able to create economic growth and er eradicate poverty and leverage technology. And of course, they're oftentimes leapfrogging what we're doing here and going into the future. Now, when you were running around the world doing all these things, could you have imagined at the time that you know, you'd go to like Maputo, Mozambique, and there'd be like six tech incubators? Or was it still too early to see that kind of stuff? It was too early then. Um, but what I saw were the conditions that enabled their creation. And, you know, I do think, you know, there was a period where we were too utopian about technology. Now mm. we've swung in the exact opposite direction. Now we're far too dystopian. Because to your point, Patrick, you know, just thinking about Africa, for example, you know, the caricature of Africa, the sort of close your eyes, say the word Africa, and once your sort of blink reaction has gone from it's a center of conflict and poverty to it's a place of remarkable dynamism and growth enabled in large part by technology. So I do think we've, fun, we've swung far too far on the dystopian side as opposed to recognizing just how much wealth and well-being it has created. Now, you've had an interesting path. You're a complete and total FOMO sapiens. Let, let me just read, <laughs> read some of the things you've done. So you started your career out of college as a sixth grade teacher with Teach for America. Then you move on, and I'm, maybe I'm skipping a couple steps. So you end up at this role at this, the, the State Department as a senior advisor to Hillary Clinton for innovation. Currently, you are a distinguished visiting professor at the University of Bologna Business School, which sounds so good in so many ways. You also ran for office. You ran for governor of Maryland, which is, you know, running for office is not an easy thing to do at all. You've written two books. So you've done a lot of different things. And as I read that through, I, I, my big question for you is like, what's the connective tissue, right? Like, I, you're going to tell me, you're going to sketch it all through to me and tell me why it all makes sense together. But, you know, if you were to just, if, if, if you were to just sort of look at those things, you would say like, well, this guy's done a lot of different things. I don't quite understand why he's jumped from one thing to another. So help us to understand that. Sure. Well, first of all, you're right. I am sort of the caricature of the FOMO, sap the FOMO sapiens. You know, look, we all have limited skills, right? And my, I guess the, the common thread for me has always been, if I have one skill, it's my ability to see around the corner a little bit. So here I was, I was an inner city school teacher in Baltimore. And like everybody, this was in the mid nineties. And like everybody in the mid nineties, I was seeing this technology led transformation of the economy. And I was thinking about, you know, the kids where I grew up in West Virginia and then thinking about my students in Baltimore. And I was kind of like, my goodness, in order for these young people to have good jobs in the future, they're going to have to have technology skills. And in order for them to have technology school skills, there's going to have to be some like pretty ser serious investments. 
And so I started a nonprofit based on the changes I saw coming in technology and, and in the economy. And then again, Obama, that was sort of seeing around the corner. Everybody's like, well, the president's going to be Hillary Clinton. Or the president's going to be John McCain. It's not going to be some black dude named Barack Hussein Obama. And then setting up the innovation agenda at the State Department, it was again, it's like, hey, the way in which power and diplomacy is exercised is not just going to be one white guy with a white shirt and red tie talking to another white guy with a w- white shirt and red tie, sipping tea with, you know, in a in a mahogany wainscoted room. Then the first book, Industries of the Future, written five years ago, predicted a lot of what was going to happen in areas from genomics to to cyber. And so I guess if there's one thread, it's seeing around the corner and then doing something about it, whether it's building a company, whether it's backing a political candidate, in this case, Barack Obama, whether it's writing a book. So it's always been, you know, look, I have limited skills, but the one thing I always have been able to do is see a couple steps ahead. And then I just try to light a little path for it. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah, we're going to get into that because your new book really does that. And it's interesting as I listen to you because I'm thinking to myself, so I'm terrible at seeing the future. I'm really good at seeing a lot of different things right now and putting them into context with each other. Like I can walk into a hotel in Guadalajara and I can, it reminds me of something I saw in, I don't know, Bhutan or something. I, I really am able to thread the needle there, but like, it's, you know, I miss out on all the new trends for the people who are listening, who are like, wow, I want to do what Alec does. What do you think it is about your personality or your experience that allows you to see into the future? A lot of it is listening to young people and knowing which ones to listen to. So one of the mistakes that people make when they grow wealthier or they grow more powerful is they spend all their time listening to or seeking out people who are wealthier still or more powerful still and seeking out wisdom and insight from them. When instead, in truth, those people more often than not became wealthy or became powerful because they started something new, because they themselves, even if it was, even if it was just one time in their life, they created something. And so I guess for me, what it is, it's my affinity for the, sort of the creator class. And that isn't all tied to age. But in my case, you know, part of the reason why I continue to teach and continue to spend time with people in their 20s is because they do see the world with different eyes than I do in my 40s. So part of it is not segregating myself socially. Part of it is remembering that, you know, I was born with one mouth and two ears and to try to keep that ratio in order too, instead of just telling everybody how the world works, trying to listen to the perspectives of as many other people as possible. It's good advice because I think about, I think about people I know who, as they've gotten older, you know, there's this natural tendency to self segregate into people who are like you, you move to a certain neighborhood in a certain city and you start to look around the neighborhood and everybody looks like you and they have the same education and they're the same religion and they kind of do the same things. And what happens is I've seen it with friends, you become a dinosaur. And then when there are social movements or technologies that come along and we're in a time of rapid change, you just learn, you're like, I just don't understand that. Like, how could it be that this group of people is doing this now because they feel this way? I just don't understand who they are. And the problem is you don't know anybody who's living in that world who can explain to you what it is. Now, one final thing before we get into the Raging 20s is, you know, success. you're a very successful guy, obviously. Successful people have to say no to a lot. You've done a lot of different things. As you think about what you say no to, what are the kinds of things that you say no to and and how do you sort of do that without, because I imagine, you know, people are offering you things all the time. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing is I try to choose things that are fun and, you know, fun, not just meaning sort of entertainment, but being around people who I'm excited to be around. That honestly is more important than how many zeros are in a contract or, or something like that. Um, So I've gotten to be really, 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 really choosy. Um, You have to be, because unfortunately, when you do fill up your schedule, part of what you also do is you fill up your brain. And so your ability to be creative, your ability to write, your ability to, you know, for things to happen with with a measure of serendipity fades. With everything you say yes to, serendipity fades. 
In terms of how I say no, this is something I learned the hard way. Really straightforward and painfully honest. It's just kind of like this doesn't line up with where I'm spending my time right now. Nothing at all against what you're doing, but it's not something I'm going to put time into. No commas, no woulda, coulda, shoulda, high, uh, conditional language, just being as very straightforward as possible. And I find that that offends people less than giving a longer or even trying to be, give a more polite, uh, trying to give a more uh, polite response. And then the, I guess the other thing that I would add to are things that compound, like whether it's a community or it's a, it's a place geographically, I do find that instead of spreading myself out all over the world um, into every topic imaginable, picking a few lanes where I go deep, not at the expense of learning new things, but picking a few places and a few lanes to go deep on, I find to be more rewarding as well. All right. So let's get into this new book, which I have been devouring. It is very timely. It's called The Raging Twenties, not The Roaring Twenties, The Raging Twenties. So Tell us why you wrote this book now and why you chose that particular title. I chose to write the book now because I feel like we're at one of those inflection points. You know, it reminds me of the late 1920s amidst an economic crisis where the United States t uh, tilted toward the New Deal, Italy tilted toward fascism, and Germany tilted toward Nazism. So very similar circumstances within the countries but went in wildly different directions. I think about the 1840s, you know, when Europe was having a very difficult time uh, managing fast-paced industrialization. What happened? The largest wave of revolutions in Europe's history and ideological movements like communism. The Communist Manifesto was written in 1848. So I feel like we're at another one of those moments of transition and where at the end of the 2020s, whether we look more like Mad Max or whether we look more like Star Trek is going to be based on a couple decisions we make between now and then. And I think we figured out that in the United States, we are not immune to going in the wrong direction. You know, we could we could become um, a center of rage ourselves. So I wrote it and I wrote it before and during the pandemic. And the pandemic, frankly, has only accelerated this. As I listen to you, you say we, and I want to understand who we is because I'm thinking back, you mentioned Germany, and I'm thinking back to the 1920s in Germany when like the wheels started to fall off the cart. And at that same time, Argentina was like the third most prosperous, prosperous country in the world. And so you had this weird, like there was no we in that because these were countries that went on very different paths um, and so I'm curious, do you think we're all more closely aligned now or is the we America or how do you think about that? I think of this as sort of the democratic capitalistic West. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say we, I'm thinking of the United States and sort of democratic capitalistic Western Europe. Now, that's not to say that the book isn't written for people everywhere. And in, and in fact, I do think I'm very proud of the fact that I think it's sort of a global book. Um, but I but I do think when I say we, I mean, people that are a certain sp stage of development in capitalism. And thinking, for example, about Argentina, you know, 110 years ago, the United States and Argentina did have the same GDP. And we we went in entirely different directions. Um, and, you know, may, many Asian states and others have chosen their model for what of what the social contract will look like this decade. We have not yet, which is why I say we. FOMO. FOMO. So I like what, what I think is cool about what you're doing is you, you're thinking about big things. You know, there's no small thinking in the raging twenties. <laughs> so talk about some of those big ideas and how, I guess you see the world evolving in the next 10 years. Yeah. So look, first of all, for whatever reason, I, I cannot. I cannot do small things. I would rather do big things and fail. Like I ran for governor of Maryland and I lost. I, you know, I, I, I can only do big things for better or worse. Um, as Theodore Roosevelt said, dare mighty deeds, even if checkered by failure. Some of the big things that I think we need to do, you know, one example I give is, and this is sort of in the news these days, is a global minimum tax. You know, one of the big problems we have right now is, is the fact that capital is global and mobile and with a rise of globalization, which I think has been an overwhelming good for humanity, 
part of what it means is that a barista at Starbucks making less, make, making minimum wage is paying less in taxes than Starbucks. Somebody, and a FedEx driver is probably paying more in taxes uh, than Federal Express. Those are actually examples rooted in the actual math of their tax bills. And so I do think one of the big bills, one of the big ideas is that we need to completely reorient our, our tax regime globally. A second big idea is, and this is something that's much debated and much debated in your world, Patrick, is stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism. You know, I've gone from being a, a midnight janitor and working on a beer truck in West Virginia to, you know, the world of capital, the world of the, the top 1%. And I have seen how it's a sort of heads I win, tails you lose world when you are in the world of capital as opposed to in the world of labor. And I'm a capitalist, but I do think that one of the big ideas that we have to put in place is a capitalism that isn't just redistributionist, but that works better for a broader set of stakeholders. There is redistribution that's an important part of it. But I think that the the sort of Mad Max-like capitalism that we have right now is going to make violent political movements that we've seen from both the far left and far right larger and more frequent. So the kind of rage that we've seen recently is only going to is only going to get bigger and and more frequent. Yeah, in fact, on that point, I have we have these conversations a lot. I mean, it's like kind of thing people talk about and you know, as I always say to my friends who are against rethinking capitalism, it's like just remember when the revolution happens, the people are coming to the gated community, you know, to express their rage they're not going to the middle class neighborhood. And so if you don't evolve the system, we're going to end up looking like many countries in the world. And I don't want to pick on you, Brazil, because I love Brazil. But if you go to Sao Paulo and you go to the nice neighborhood like Jardines, there is like there, you know, so much security around these buildings. And so you're living in this very uncomfortable place where there's a lot of inequality and political instability and stuff like that. So, yeah, that that is I mean, that's a huge topic. But it's one that I just wonder as you think about that, okay, great. I agree with you. Many of our listeners agree with you, but who leads that conversation? Is it the government? Is it business? You know, how does that happen? Because it's sort of like evolving a system where you have all these messed up incentives. And so nobody has an incentive to do anything. No, that's a, that is the most important question that could be asked. It's multi-stakeholder. So this has happened before. Like, again, the revolutions of the 1840s, what happened? What, how, how did industrialization end up working out? Well, the first thing was there was this wave of authoritarian leaders that came in that basically tried to establish control. And this is happening around the world right now with people like Erdogan and Putin and Bolsonaro and Duterte and Trump. You know, people in times of instability love strongmen. So that's sort of the first wave. But the second wave, it's like, OK, either you're going to have a dictator and the dictator is going to tell everybody exactly what to do, or you're going to rewrite your social contract. So it was people like Otto von Bismarck, a great big military figure from 19th century Germany, who basically said the way we're going to make industrialization work in Germany is we're going to have this thing called a minimum wage. We're going to have child labor laws. So instead of 11-year-olds losing their fingers in the factories, you have to be 16. There's going to be, hey, if you work in a factory after 25 or so years, at the end of it, there's going to be a pension. So as we innovated technologically, we also innovated with our public policy and created things like free public education, pensions, child labor laws, minimum wages. All of these things made industrialization work. We're now transitioning again. And so as we innovate technologically, we need to start innovating again with our public policy. The ideas from that come from academia. They come from, they come from worker movements. They come from, they come from government. But ultimately, it takes movements to make these sorts of things happen. So somebody listening right now says, okay, great. Alex sees the future. And I want to be well positioned for, you know, the next 10 years, what are the kinds of things that we should all be doing to just be ready for the change ahead of us? Well, first of all, interdisciplinary learning. And I don't care if you're 15 or you're 55. Um, you know, 20 years ago, I think that there was a push for everybody to go into STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And that was very well reasoned. And that push has continued into the present day. If you have a base of skills that are technical in nature, you're going to be good. Like you're not going to, 
you are not going to be poor if you've got real science, technology, engineering, or math chops. But if you want to lead in that world, if you want to be resilient, if you want to be mobile, if you want to be a FOMO sapiens, then you need to combine skills that may be technical in nature, but also with skills that we associate with the humanities, whether it's emotional intelligence and understanding of behavioral psychology, communications abilities. So it's that kind of interdisciplinary lifelong learning that I think in a world where when you go to work, either you're telling a machine what to do or a machine's telling you what to do, interdisciplinary learning helps ensure that you're on the better side of that equation. A lot of people say, well, you know, college is irrelevant now. You teach students. And so you're part of the system. I'm curious how you think about that conversation. I actually teach at the world's oldest university. The University of Bologna is founded in 1088, if you can believe that. And uh, how do I think college is absolutely not irrelevant? Uh, we can learn at home or we can learn on campus. But the learning environment in my classroom is a lot more robust than the learning environment that any one individual is going to have with his or her laptop. Um, it, it's the dynamism, the range in nature of instruction, what you're going to be exposed to. It is a challenge, for, though, for colleges and universities to make sure that instruction isn't just something that you can put on YouTube. Um, so, you know, it, it does challenge higher education to be better. But at the top level of higher education, where professors are engaging with their students with some depth and where students are engaging with, with each other with some dynamism, the experience can't be beaten. I agree. I agree. And, and also just, I mean, discipline, right? Find me somebody who has the discipline to, I mean, some people do, but I certainly didn't. So it is just harder when you don't have imposed structure upon you in order to learn. Now, Alec, a lot of times we ask people to say, well, you know, if you went back and talked to yourself when you were 10 years old or 20 years old, what advice would you give yourself? I'm going to give you a little bit of a trickier, bigger, because you like big things question, which is this. I looked it up last day. America is 245 years old. Okay. If we went back to America when she was 200 years old, what advice would you give her? to invest, to overinvest in our poorest communities, rural and urban. Nobody regrets investments in infrastructure and skills. Um, you know, nobody ever says, you know, gosh, darn it, that was sure a wasted investment in a railway. That was a wasted investment in a bridge. That was a wasted investment in a high speed rail system. Gee, that internet was too fast. We didn't need all that speed. No, I mean, Look, investments in infrastructure are like putting protein in your body. And similarly, I would invest very heavily, not because for like the kumbaya, it's the right thing to do, but investing very heavily in skills development in poor urban and rural communities. So if you look at the costs, whether it's incarceration, whether it's drug addiction, whatever it is, the costs of people not being resilient in the economy today are orders of magnitude greater than they would have been if we had sort of flooded the zone uh, with investments in education and skills development in those communities. All right, everybody, if you want to find out more, you can go over to alecross.com. The name of the book is The Raging 2020s, Countries, Companies, People, and the Fight for the Future. Alec Ross, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Patrick. FOMO. Can't get enough of FOMO Sapiens? Join me on Patreon for ad-free episodes, bonus material, and exclusive content that will help you to master FOMO and position yourself for greater success in both business and life. Go to patreon.com slash FOMO Sapiens to learn more. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I love hearing from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.